All right, good morning. As we begin, uh, I want to invite you to open up your Bibles or your Bible app to Romans chapter 8 and uh, verses 14 through 17. I want to read that uh, for us now. We're going to be looking at a lot of different scriptures today uh, in the brief time that we have, uh, but we want to start here and and maybe give this our emphasis uh, today is what we read. But Romans chapter 8, 14 through 17, and hear the word of the Lord. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. God, we come today grateful for the ways you work in our lives and for the reading and the hearing of your holy word. And we pray and ask God that as we consider your word today, that you would speak to us, uh, that you would uh, do a work in our hearts, God, uh, that we would encounter the presence of your Holy Spirit today in in a real way. So God, we love you. We thank you. And uh, we uh, are are just blessed beyond belief uh, to be with you today. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so um, we're so glad that you're here today. Trying to set something here because we have communion today. And so I have to be, you know, did you see the memes on or maybe it's just in in pastor's world that because of the time frame and we had the setback in time that uh, pastors get an extra hour to preach today. And uh, (laughs) so I'm setting my clock to ensure that I only stick to the hour. No, just kidding. For those of you who are guests, that's not what's going to happen. Uh, so, so glad that you're here today, and uh, we are, uh, it's just a beautiful day to be here. It is All Saints Day or All Saints Sunday. Uh, part of what we do is, is remember the saints that have gone on before us. Hebrews chapter 12 talks about a great cloud of witnesses, and uh, there are many who have gone on to be a part of that cloud in our community, uh, and certainly in your lives and families as well too, and who testify to God's grace and God's love. And so in a moment when we come to the table, we'll remember them. Uh, so today, I uh, was thinking about this. Andrea and I moved here uh, 23 and a half years ago. Uh, I feel like maybe we're almost locals. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, almost natives. I guess our kids are. Uh, but we've lived here longer than we've lived anywhere else. Uh, so maybe that says something uh, to that effect of, of what, uh, where we are. But I, w- I will tell you something. I've only gone on t- in a boat out into the bay once in 23 years. Uh, and, and, and pretty much that once was enough. Uh, because there was a congregation member uh, who, who's not here today, but, uh, you know, I might have to, their, their parents are here, so they might have to prod them a little bit. They took me out in the water, and they told me it's going to be great. The waves are minimal, and it's about this time of year. They're only like two to three feet is what they're calling for. We got out there, it was four to six, <laughs> and it was a lot choppier, and, and uh, so it was, it was an experience to go out there. But something, so I've gone out once, but something that's really beautiful, I love when you cross the Bay Bridge and you're heading over uh, to like the Baltimore area, or maybe you're coming back and you look off to the side of the bridge, uh, I think it's the Annapolis Yacht Club or whatever's out there, they've got all the sailboats, right? And uh, Andrea doesn't like it because I'm driving and I'm trying to look at the sailboats, and she's, you know, trying to keep me on the road in the straight and narrow. It's a bad habit of mine uh, to look when I should be driving. Uh, but there's all the sailboats off to the side, I think, like they always look so majestic and so beautiful out there, and depending on the wind, you know, they can, they can get a lot of speed out there. And, uh, and I was, that, that makes me think about what it would be like to go sailing sometime. And, and again, I've never gone sailing, and so probably if I was getting ready to go sailing, like I, I could read a book or a magazine about it or something, or, or like today, like we learn everything from YouTube, right? And so we, we just YouTube like how to sail a boat sort of thing. That, that's what I'd do if I ever got trapped and was the last person on a sailboat, like how to sail a boat. And we could learn all that we needed to learn about the wind and the sail and how to do it and when to raise it, when to lower it, and all these sorts of things. I could build my own sailboat. My kids uh, all had the same, or almost all had the same day- daycare provider uh, w- before they went to like kindergarten and preschool, and her husband was building a sailboat for the entire 12 years that we went there with our kids. I don't think that he ever finished it, and that's not a, like, that's just a man project there. You know, it's easier to start something than to finish something sometimes, uh, but he was building it, and like, if I wanted to build a sailboat, like, I, I could. I could go out. I could learn how to build it. Uh, I, could, I could paint it and seal it and do all the things that were necessary to get it ready to go out in the water. Some of you have sailed before. I could talk to you. You could tell me how to do it, how to sail, how to be successful, how to have a good time out there and sailing. And so the day would come where I would take my sailboat, take it over to the the Chesapeake, 
push it out into the water, get out into it, do whatever I needed to do, raise the sail on it. But in that moment, you learn a valuable lesson. You're only going to go as far as God provides the wind, right? A sailboat is no good without any wind unless you've got a, you know, a motor on it. Uh, but to sail, you need the wind of God. And so over the last couple of weeks, we're in a series on the Holy Spirit where we have been talking about the divine wind or the divine breath of God that we see in Scripture, the Holy Spirit that speaks into us, that fills us with life, that orders our chaos, uh, and, 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 and that empowers us for ministry. Uh, two weeks ago, Pastor Nada uh, shared with us that the Holy Spirit is God's living presence in our life, that God is, is present not somewhere out there, but through the Holy Spirit, that, that God is present in us and around us and, and with us. Last week, uh, we talked uh, that the Holy Spirit is not a thing, but a person. And so when we think about the Spirit, we're not praying to or talking to something that is out there again. We're talking to a person who, who walks alongside of us, who goes with us through the highs and the lows. And so in that way, just like we do with God and with Christ, we, we cultivate a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And, and remember, like, because of our Christian faith, we have a triune God, so Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, three persons. And my, one of my seminary professors said three relations, uh, three ways we relate and interact with God and encounter the presence of God in which God is revealed. And so today, I want to talk at, as we've looked at the person, the person of the Holy Spirit and, and in a general introduction, I want to talk today about the work of the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit does in us and through us. So the, and, and I want to think in regards to relationships, but especially families, okay? And, and, and try to think of this in a way as a family. The first is that the Holy Spirit gives us new birth. One of the, the better known scriptures in, in the New Testament is John chapter 3, and immediately you hear John 3. If you grew up in the church, you think of John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Uh, but in that story, the bigger uh, context of the story, Nicodemus, a, a Pharisee, a religious leader in Jerusalem, has come to Jesus at night. He's not ready to do it in the daytime yet, uh, but begins asking questions of Jesus and inquiring uh, about him. And Jesus tells Nicodemus that no one uh, can see God without being born from above or born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus asks, you know, like, how, how can that be true? How can, how can we enter into our mother's womb a second time? Or even better, how can we leave our mother's womb a second time? And, and Jesus says there at this point, he says, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water in the Spirit. Now there's a lot we could talk about on this text that we don't have time, but the emphasis is, is that the Spirit gives us new birth. There is something new in us that happens when the Spirit fills our heart and our lives, and we ask the Spirit uh, to do that. And we have this problem in our own humanity, whether it, because of our humanity, sometimes it's a little bit cultural as well, but it, it goes across all cultures, that we feel like that we can be good enough to earn our salvation, uh, that we can live good lives. I hear this a lot of times from people like, I'm a good person. Uh, and, and, you know, the Scripture tells us that no one is good that we've all sinned and fallen short. And, and without the power of the Holy Spirit to give us new birth, we, are, we live apart from God. And we need the presence of the Holy Spirit in us as we put our faith in Jesus to be able to enter God's kingdom. It is necessary to be reborn and to be made new through the Holy Spirit's power. So as the Holy Spirit gives us new birth, the Spirit gives us a new family. Right, like when you have a child and they're born in the family, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And, uh, you know, everyone comes and gathers around and celebrates with you uh, about this child that you've had. And when we experience new birth through the Holy Spirit, it's, this, it's the same idea that we have been born into a new family. We receive a new family, the kingdom of God, uh, uh, the family of God, the church, our brothers and sisters in Christ. In this passage from Romans that we read a little bit ago in, in chapter 8, uh, Paul writes that we are adopted into God's family when we live by the Holy Spirit. Uh, Andrea and I are adoptive parents, and, and we love when you read through the Bible and we see stories of adoption and adoption language, and it's, it's far more common than, than I realized before we became adoptive parents. But when you adopt someone, uh, and we did an international adoption, and, and you go to an orphanage, the, a child is in an orphanage because they've lost their parents. 
because there is no longer any family available to them. So they come there lacking a family. Many of them, in the case of of our boys and those who are adopted from China, uh, if they get there at a certain age, they don't have a name yet. And so it's up to the orphanage to to provide them a name. Uh, Interestingly enough, in China and the different regions, when we adopted our kids, all the orphans in that area every single year get the same last name. Uh, and so they, they, they begin this connection. It's almost like Jon Snow from Game of Thrones. So those of you there, you get a, a name that identifies you as, as an orphan. So there was, there was no family, no name. And, and when you think about the prospects of someone with no family, no name, and growing up in a system like this, there is very little hope. And here's what happens from the biblical text. When, when Paul writes that we are adopted into God's family, what happens when we see that is that we are first given a new family. We are adopted into the family of God that we are called co-heirs with Christ. We have the full benefit, uh, the full, um, uh, uh, we receive all the benefits of being a natural born son or daughter of God, brother with Christ. We have received the full inheritance. It doesn't matter that we're not blood. We have been adopted into the family. We receive a new family. We receive a new name. We are sons and daughters of the king, co-heirs, brothers and sisters with Christ. We have this new name as Christian, little Christ. And then thirdly, we have a new hope. Our, Our eternal position has been completely changed. When a child is adopted, there is a reversal of fortune for that child as they are brought in from an orphanage to a family. There's a reversal for the family as well, too. It's a blessing for both. But as we are adopted into God's family, there is, a, there is a change, there is a reversal there of fortune as we are co-heirs with Christ. And we begin to develop this intimacy with God. We're not just, God's not just somewhere far off. God is the one who chose us to adopt us. God says, I want you. I love you. In the same way that adoptive parents will say yes to that child, God has said yes to you and we be, begin to be able to develop intimacy with this new family. But not only are we given a new family, we, the Spirit gives us a new likeness to the family. Now, I have this video on my phone of Abby when she's like six years old playing t-ball here in, in Milford. And uh, she, she's up to bat and she gets a hit. And I'm on first base, supposed to be the first base coach or umpire, but I'm actually recording my daughter on my phone because that's what a good dad does, right? And, and, and she hits the ball, and she goes running down the first, and I say something, I don't remember, like, all right, Abby, good job, whatever it was, run, something like that. And I remember, as clear as could be, that later that day or the next day, I watched that video, and I listened in horror, because I sounded exactly like my father. How many, and then really, that's not a bad thing, but how many of us, when we were younger, we grew up and we said, I am not going to be like my parents, right? They said things to us, uh, especially when we got in trouble, let's be honest, right? And we told our parents with great confidence, I am never going to say that to my kids. And then comes the day when we say it and we're like, oh my gosh, I am just like my mom or I'm just like my dad. You know, and there's all sorts of ways that we do that. But there is a likeness that we have because there is a, there is, there's a physical likeness. People know me when I go home because of how, I, even though I've been gone 24 years, they still recognize me because I look like my dad, just 30 years younger, you know, and, and, and so they know me. Even in adoptive children, Like, our boys, uh, they're adopted from China. Like, they will never physically look like us in a lot of ways, but they'll begin to talk like us. They're going to pick up our speech patterns. They're going to pick up our our mannerisms and all these sorts of things, and they become recognizable by the way they live. In the same way, we are, the Spirit conforms us and shapes us into the likeness of Christ. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3.18, he says this, and all of us are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Each of us are being transformed by the Spirit. Now let me ask you this, brothers and sisters. Have you been transformed by the Spirit? Is your life in Christ different today than it was a year ago? Different today than it was when you first came to faith? Because the scripture says there will be a transformation the longer we walk with Christ, the longer we dwell with Christ, the longer we we seek the Spirit's presence in our life, that that we should look more and more like Jesus in our lives. 
the sin that plagued us years ago, we should, we should turn away from that and trust in the power of the Spirit so that we are no longer slaves, Paul writes in Romans, to that sin. And so that likeness that we should have, we see Paul talks about in, in 1 Corinthians in the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, the evidence, right? The evidence of the Spirit's presence in our life. And so if you are a follower of Christ, if I am a follower of Christ, and I live by the presence of the Spirit, then people should see the evidence of that. They should see in my life love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Friends, is there more joy in your life because of Christ today than there was a year ago? Is there more self-control in your walk than there, today than there was when you first came to faith? Do we practice peace with our neighbors at a greater level today than we did five years ago? We should be conforming and allow our lives to look like Jesus, and this is done through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so we are, the, the Spirit creates a family likeness. But not only a family likeness, the Spirit gives us gifts to work with and live with in our lives. Okay, so it is, let's real talk right now. It's November 5th. Christmas is like 50 days away, right? Something like that. Real talk, right? Okay. Uh, my boys have already given us their Christmas list. Okay, they have already thought about it. They have written it out. They have combed through the Amazon catalog. They, they ask all the time, Dad, can I search something up on Amazon? And, and I know that they're doing their shopping on there and stuff. Uh, our daughters, because they have phones, we like get little notifications that their birthday or Christmas list has been updated on their, on their, on their note that they, it's just a running note that anytime they think of something that they want, ding, ding, update. You know, they have their list. They know, because they know that as a family we give gifts at Christmas and birthdays, like, because we love each other, right? We love each other. And, and God is the same way. Because God loves us, because God loves you, uh, the Spirit gives us gifts uh, to do the work that God has called us to do. Uh, that our, God our Father loves to give us gifts. In fact, Paul writes, now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of services, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but the same God who activates all of them and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Each of us, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and the Spirit dwells in us and we invite the Holy Spirit into our lives and, and we walk with the Spirit, the Spirit gives me, you, all of us, gifts for the common good, for the good of our families, for the good of our church, for the good of our community, to share the good news of Jesus Christ, to offer grace and peace and mercy to those around us. It's not just for the pastors. It's just not for the Sunday school teachers. It's not for the missionaries or the apostles. It's for you and us and all of us. You are called and gifted. My friend Tommy, uh, when we were growing up, Tommy was smart. He never had to study for anything, even in college. Uh, you know, he, he, he's a doctor now, and uh, when he did uh, organic chemistry, I think that was the hardest class he had in undergrad. I don't know that he studied a single night. But when we were in elementary school, uh, Tom was in, Tommy was in the gifted program, right? Uh, okay? I was not. I always wanted to know, like, how'd you get in? And like, I don't know, they just came and got me. And I'm like, well, I want to get in. And I'd ask around about it, and the teachers were like, sorry, Steve. No, <laughs> that's not for you, okay? Let's, let's focus over here, okay? Like, but here, God says, God looks at all of us and says, you're gifted. You're gifted. And says, go out and use it. And we can talk about the parables, about how, you know, the, the parable of the talents that we, we're given stuff, and we need to invest it and use it. Because God's going to say, How, what did you do with it? You are gifted by the Holy Spirit for the common good. We can't sit back and say, I can't do that. We can't sit back and say, I don't know that God's called me to that. There may be certain things we're called to and not called to, but you are gifted to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and to be a minister in the world. And this is what's so important. The next thing is that the Spirit empowers us to do ministry. And we talked about this last week. You can go online and listen to the whole thing. But just in, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus, before he ascends into heaven, tells his disciples to wait for me in Jerusalem. 
And wait for the gift of the Holy Spirit, because when the Holy Spirit will come, the Spirit will come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Makes this nice little concentric circles outside of Jerusalem, going to the ends of the earth. But you will receive what? Power. See, so many times we think about our faith and we think it's that, that, that being a follower of Christ is, is for sissies or wussies or something like that and whatever it might be. But the Spirit says that I will give you power to do the things, all the things that God has called us to do. There is power in you and in us when we go with the Holy Spirit to pray with someone. There is power of the Holy Spirit in us when we go and visit the sick. There is power when we care for the homeless and offer them hope. There is power in us through the Holy Spirit when we go and share our faith, our testimony, whatever it might be. We don't go meek and mild. Uh, Certainly we can be meek, but that doesn't mean we're lacking power. And it's not power that comes from within me. It's the power of the presence of the Holy Spirit so that we can be witnesses so we can testify to what we've seen. You're gifted and empowered to testify and be witnesses. All of us to do that. It's not one person's job or a handful of people's job or the pastor's job. It is all of our job. And so as a pastor and as, as a Christian, and like I want to be part of a church where we know the power of the Holy Spirit, where we long for the power of the Holy Spirit. Because when the Spirit, where the Spirit is, one, it says there is freedom, the Scripture says, but there's also power for transformation. Do you know how the early church formed and succeeded? It wasn't because they sent out really cool marketing campaigns like through the mail. They weren't making clever, you know, Facebook posts or TikToks, you know. No pastor was in the first century church was doing cool dances on TikTok and then posting them up there. It was the power of the Holy Spirit that when Peter and the others went about and Barnabas and whoever, and they went to different places and they prayed for people who were blind, they regained their sight. When people were sick and they, they touched the hem of, of their clothes, they were healed. There was forgiveness and reconciliation that was, that was going on as evidence of the Spirit's power. How exciting would it be for us as at Avenue Church and for the believers in our communities, because it's not just for us, that we lived in the power of the Holy Spirit where people were healed, where the blind received their sight, physical or spiritual, where relationships were restored, where there's places of unforgiveness and bitterness that those were renewed, where our hearts of stone, were, we received hearts of flesh because of the Holy Spirit's presence. This is the type of community we are called to be a part of. And, you know, within our community, there, there, are, there is a great cloud of witnesses, to use Hebrew's phrase, of saints who have gone on, who testify, and whose lives testify to us the presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of of the Holy Spirit. Their lives are examples to each of us of the Spirit's presence and power. And I'm grateful for the example of the saints both in this church and in my life who have have shared their faith with me, who have prayed with me, who have pointed to the importance of the Gospels and of the Scriptures and of life in Christ. Their lives testify of the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God. My life would not be the same if these saints did not cultivate a friendship with the Holy Spirit and walk with the Holy Spirit daily. On this All Saints Day, we remember those who have joined the great cloud of witnesses. We remember their life and their faith. We also remember those of us who have been left behind, who grieve and mourn the loss of those that we love. And whether we read off their name in a little bit or, or whether they are just in our hearts, Jesus promised the Holy Spirit for a day like today. For in John chapter 14, one of the other ways the Spirit works is that the Spirit gives us peace. And if you've been to one of the funerals that I've ever, ever seen, I almost always talk about this because it's so important. That before Jesus ascended into heaven, the Spirit, that Jesus promised the Holy Spirit to him that I will not leave you like orphans, that I've gone to prepare a place for you, and that I'll send the Holy Spirit to bring peace. Not peace as the world brings, 
warm, fuzzy feeling, everything's good, absence of conflict. That's the peace the world brings, but a peace that is d- deeper. And the peace that, that Jesus talks about is this shalom, this wholeness, that even though we can miss someone, the disciples were going to see Jesus leave, that their presence, their life has impacted us and shaped us uh, indelibly. And so we are wholly who we are because they're place in our lives. So today as we prepare to come to the table, let us seek the Spirit's presence and power to comfort and to bring us peace. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.